I think one of the reasons I really wanted to do Moonfall was because it related to the odd times in which we find ourselves living in with this COVID pandemic. And I think uh, normally big disaster movies like this are movies that people seem to gravitate towards. I think they can see themselves in them. We all have this fascination about the end of the world and what would that look like and how would we live through that? Would we live through that? And um, because the pandemic is so much, I think a part of our everyday life right now, a movie like this sort of resonated with me in a, in a different way. I thought it would be more relatable now than ever before. Um, within, you know, the constructs of our life right now. I had one conversation with Roland in the, in the early days. Um, uh, it, it was very quick. You know, we talked about the movie. You know, you read a movie like this and you really understand what it's about. You know, it's pretty easy to understand. So we sort of had a meeting of the minds. And originally this role was written for a man though I do know that, and so credit to Roland for taking a character that was male and then realizing that this could be a female character and still have the same impact. I describe Fowler as um, wicked smart. You know, I think she's a woman who survived in a man's world. You don't become an astronaut. And when we find her, she is, you know, the deputy director of the NASA. You don't find a woman in that position who isn't extremely intelligent, strong, has a real um, sense of self about her. She's got, she's very willful. You know, she's had to survive in this world and hold her own. And so that's how I describe her. She's strong. I love characters. I love women and characters like this. Yeah, I think we find them in the beginning and they're the best of friends. Like Brian was at her wedding. She clearly knew he knew her husband and they were like workmates. Like I was his, you know, work wife and he was my work husband and very, very close. And then this event happens in the movie where we get estranged. There's sort of a misunderstanding, something very confusing and scientifically um, unexplainable happens. And my character doesn't exactly stand up for him the way she probably could have. And he sort of takes the fall and sort of that starts the beginning of the unraveling of their relationship and we get to visit them again in the movie and they have a chance to sort of sort of wrong that right to come to terms with what happened and realize that neither one of them were right or wrong it was just a very um, unfortunate situation that was hard to explain and they sort of went their separate ways as a result of it Well, what's happening is the moon is threatening to crash into Earth. And when it does that, before it gets there, it'll break into a billion trillion little pieces that will all come crashing onto the Earth and will pretty much kill everyone. So, you know, they've got a big problem that they're trying to figure out a way to solve. And what we come to find out is that there's some sort of alien force at work and it goes against everything that science believes so you have the battle of science and metaphysics and what is possible in both of those realms but it's clear that something is happening that has caused the moon to move out of its orbit and start descending onto earth and there's a ticking clock on it so if they don't get up to the moon and figure out what this thing is and sort of destroy it then Little by little, the Earth, the moon is moving closer and closer to the Earth and potentially causing destruction. That opening attack, first of all, we're looking at nothing. <laughs> There's nothing. It's all imagination. And I think these are movies that, you know, are very different from other movies. We really have to be able to commit to our imagination, and Roland can share with us the previs and give us a basic idea of what will be happening, but we know all too well that it's gonna be more vivid, more alive, more real than we can even imagine. But we ha we're forced to use our imagination and um, work to Roland or someone else reading out things to us that are actually happening that we have to react to. 
And, it, and it's a really different way of working. It sometimes can feel very disconnected, very, you know, disjointed. Um, and we have to trust in what's going to happen on the other side because we really literally, for the most part, are really looking at nothing much but some visuals on a screen that are kind of assimilating what we might see with color tone and light flashes, you know, things like that. But we're really not seeing anything of what we're really going to see. We were out on the street. Um, it's supposed to be an LA street and we're in Montreal, Canada. So we were racing the snowfall <laughs> and the winter coming because we were shooting in the fall. But yeah, we were out on a, on a big street and we're retrieving our endeavor. And of course there's nothing. So we have to just imagine that this big <laughs> spaceship is being rolled down the street and rolling through a neighborhood that's crashing all the, you know, structures down around it. And again, it's just, you know, back to acting basics 101, using our imagination and creating for ourselves what that would look like, feel like, how we would, you know, feel in the situation. Um, that, that, that's the job on movies like this. It's, it's a lot of really make-believe. Recreating the gravity was pretty easy for me. I played an astronaut on a television show once for two years, so I actually did a zero-G flight, which was amazing to get to do that. So I have in my body what it feels like to float and what weightlessness is and how the body moves. And, you know, I really understood fundamentally what that was. So those were just fun things for me to revisit. The stunts weren't... Based on what I've done in the stunt world, the stunts were pretty mild on this for me. Roland does like to build, you know, and luckily he's got the money to build. Not everybody does these days, so he has been building up a storm. Um, that's true, and the sets are, you know, just walking into the NASA set was pretty impressive. I think many people have um, a secret fantasy about walking into one of the most important rooms in the world and actually standing in there and feeling what that would feel like. So that was, I think, pretty impressive. And then also sitting inside the shuttle. While it was in pieces, you know, and we used different parts of it at different times, it was also still pretty impressive to realize, you know, just how small the space is and how these astronauts have to sort of maneuver in this capsule, this very small world, and how actually claustrophobic that actually is. We know that we're touching buttons that real astronauts have touched and real equipment that they actually use to fly. And, it's, and we also had an astronaut, um, an astronaut here with us to also give us you know, all the rundown about the buttons, what we should push, not push, like, so that we tried to bring as much authenticity to all of those scenes as we possibly could. So we weren't just, if we were pushing buttons or clicking things, we weren't just randomly choosing, oh, this looks good, I'm gonna do that. We had a lot of you know, um, advice and um, sort of tutelage on what were the right buttons and when you push what for what and why you do what you do. So we tried to keep it as authentic as we could. In our movie, you know, there's a, a very interesting school of thought that maybe the moon is a megastructure. Maybe the moon has been built by a alien life form and that the inside of the moon is actually hollow and there's this life living inside of the moon. So we sort of explore that thought in this movie and what if that were true and that's sort of the metaphysics, you know, element to this movie that sort of is juxtaposed to the science, to the science that we think we know and that we believe in. So that's what makes it a little different. But I think the moon is really, really powerful. Whatever it is or anyone thinks it is, it's true that the moon has such a gravitational pull on the tides. It has so much pull on us as humans because we're mostly water. So if it can change you know, the tide, the biggest body of water on the earth, I think we have to believe that it can also affect us as humans because we are largely water. So I think the moon is very, very powerful and I'm always in tune with when there's a full moon, when there's a blood moon, when all the moons become really important in, in my life. And I meditate a lot and the moon is really, really important. I think we do make a ragtag group. That's a really good way to put it. <laughs>
we are all kind of anti-heroes. I don't think any one of us want to be there, but yet we have to be there, you know? Um, and I think it's great that Brian is sort of this disgruntled, doesn't want to be there, but knows he has to be there. He's struggling to get his life together. He was, you know, he dipped off and became a person who struggled with alcohol and sort of keeping his life together. Uh, my character um, is there because she's an expert navigationist, so she has to be the one to guide the mission and make sure we get where we're going. Brian gets to fly the shuttle. And Casey represents, I think, um, the everyday average guy on the flight of his life. You know, he's not an astronaut, has nothing to do with NASA, but yet he's this brilliantly, um, uh, he has this brilliant mind that has come up with the idea that the moon is a megastructure. So we realize we need him because if in fact it is a megastructure, then we're going to want a megastructure up there when we get there. So we take him along, but he is, he represents an everyday guy. If you got to go on a space shuttle, you'd be seeing it through the eyes of that, of that guy. So it's a fun group. He, you know, Casey, John brings the levity. He brings a lot of humor, you know, to the movie. And I think movies like this need that. Um, I hope my character brings some heart to it. I think being the woman up there, while she has to survive in a man's world, I think a woman's sensibility is often very different than a man's. And I hope my character brings a little bit of that. And, you know, um, Brian, uh, Patrick just brings, you know, the brawn of a man. He's there to try to save this day any way he can. And um, so I think it makes us like a good, a good trio. We all bring something a little different. My initial impressions were I thought it was a great concept, first of all. Is it an interesting story, right? That's just sort of the baseline of anything uh, that interests me. Is, is the story good? So I... One, I, I love sci-fi and don't get a chance to do it a lot, so that was a big bonus for me. I had such a great time working with Roland on Midway um, that it was an, an, an easy yes to, to, to say yes. Um, also, I felt like this, this role was, was different for me uh, in, in roles that I've done lately. Um, but my first uh, impressions of the script were that I love that it took this huge, uh, I, I love that it took this, this huge disaster film uh, idea, but really base it around one of the most interesting and controversial questions of evolution versus creation. And so for me, um, that was really fascinating to me. I like, I like when you can use a movie, even a big, splashy popcorn movie, to at least just drop something into the conversation. <laughs> I, I, I think that's really fascinating. It's hard to sort of fit this into the Roland canon, uh, other than yes, it's a it's this big epic movie that he's he knows this space. He's not afraid of the scope of a movie. No, no, no set or piece is too big. Like he just he he rolls with it. That's actually when he gets really 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 into it because he really he's got such a vision in his in his head that we're all trying to just hold on and, <laughs> and figure out where he's going with it. Um, but I, I think above all, the one thing that if I can relate this to the other Roland movies that speak to me are, yes, you can have these, this big spectacle, but you really have the, the human emotion that drives the story because you have to have people that you care about. And that is something that, I, that you see a through line with his movies, especially the ones that become these big, big successful films um, that because they can cross over just from being a big popcorn movie to going, you know, I really loved that performance. I loved that character. I felt so much for that character. So he really likes to bring out that emotion. So from that perspective, you really do see these, these different storylines that each have such a, a tremendous amount of heart. The nuts and bolts of the movie are the moon is coming towards us. We don't know why, and you, it's left up to the astronauts who have an experience, me being one of them, that many 15 years ago uh, was up there and saw something crazy extraterrestrial um, and caused a friend, uh, a fellow astronaut of mine, to, uh, we lost him. So I carry that guilt, being the captain of the ship, 
and over the course of the film, as the moon is coming towards us, we don't quite know what the moon is. Is it a planet? Is it something built? If it is, who built it? And what is this impending doom threatening the world, our world? So astronauts, uh, even though I'm out of it, astronauts have to go back in and figure out what is the problem. And all is not as it seems once we get up there. That's the cleanest version I can tell of a script that's very long. <laughs> Present day Brian is, is, is in a pretty terrible place. Uh, jobless, um, he's trying to hold on to his uh, past and he of his knowledge of being an astronaut, clearly a very smart person, but probably a, a little more of a of a rogue scientist than than a typical by the book guy, which is how he differs from Halley's character. Um, she still has a government job, and uh, and he resents that, and he and he carries a lot of guilt for what happened at at this failed mission several years ago, which got him out of NASA and you see his marriage is broken, his relationship with his son is broken, then you see his son get into some trouble. Brian wants to do anything he can to help his son, uh, but he just doesn't have the capability. He's just, everybody that's given him favors, they're just, they're running out. Like he's just, he's, he's trying and failing over and over and over and has a lot of personal problems and demons that he can't overcome. I know I'm a I'm a father of two boys. You know, mine are younger than uh, than 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 Sonny in this film. Um, but the uh, I think every parent can relate to to that. I, I I think the thing about Sonny and his relationship with his father is no matter what the reasons are that your dad is a wall, doesn't matter to a kid. Just doesn't matter. So. You understand Sonny's point. You weren't there. You're just, you're not around. You're, and, and, and I think for, uh, and he's constantly just let him down because Brian, uh, Brian has his own issues that he's fighting through. So Sonny can't see the good for what he does. Uh, and that's part of being Sonny too. You know, Sonny is not, uh, he's not the most straight laced kid either. And uh, it's a, probably a little of his dad that's rubbed off on him. And, and that's why they butt heads. And so this entire film for them is trying to just find how they can communicate um, and what, and how their relationship can move forward. To me, that's one of the most interesting relationships in the film is Brian's to Casey's. And Casey, so, so John, John Bradley plays, plays Casey Hausman, uh, and he is this very alternative, some would say wacky scientist who, you know, holds meetings in, <laughs> in hotel ballrooms and, um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but he's, uh, yes, his, his theories are very outlandish. The reality is, Brian is one of very, he's the only, in our movie, Brian is the only one who has seen uh, what's up there and what is this impending threat because his other partner, Marcus, spoiler alert, uh, does not make it in the first few minutes of the film. And uh, Hallie's character does not see it, so she has to trust my word, and she doesn't at the time. And that is a major source of contention between those two. So Brian harbors this secret of what he saw up there, which he couldn't even wrap his head around because it was some alien life form. Or, uh, and, uh, and it was horrible and terrifying and something he's never seen. So naturally, when no one else on earth can believe him or doesn't want to believe his stories, the guy that's giving the most outlandish uh, 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 theories, which is KC, I, there's just something there that it's like, you know what, I bet this guy would believe me. That's the crux of this, of, of Brian, is no one... No one believes him, no one trusts him, because it does seem so outlandish. And it doesn't help that he always shoots his mouth off and, and <laughs> shoots himself in the foot. So that's, that's not helping the cause. And I think he carries a lot of resentment uh, towards, uh, towards Fowler, towards Halley's character, because um, 
and I can't knock it. You know, she 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 wanted to continue on with her career, and and they uh, and moved up in the world, and um, and he I th felt really betrayed by that. If anything, I came in with too much knowledge of what it's like to act like you're floating because I did that for an entire movie, um, which helped, I will say. It, it, uh, um, but yeah, you know, that's, it's, uh, it's always, um, it's, it's always tough. It's always, it's always tough to pull that off because you're concerned. It's not even the, the, the movement of getting through something. It's, it's when you're talking and doing a scene and where you're, you know, any astronaut will tell you your hands naturally <laughs> fly here. Of course, if I did this in our scene right now, it would feel sort of odd. Um, so you're trying to find that balance between what looks right and what's realistic and we're not making a documentary and all of that kind of stuff. But it, it for sure is a much different uh, feel. Uh, all these apparatus, you know, the apparatus, all, the, all these things that we use to try to pull this off, it's, uh, it, it can be pretty difficult. I didn't do too much training in that, although the spacesuit we, we did a couple, uh, about an afternoon and trying to get used to because they are incredibly cumbersome and heavy. And my apologies to the people who make them, but they are not great to wear. <laughs> What to say about Halle Berry? I, for, for me, you know, um, one of the things coming into this that I felt like was going to be difficult is getting, is Brian being very, very angry with her because she has such a warm and welcoming face, to say the least, <laughs> that you just, you you want to get along. You want there to be chemistry, and of, which of course there is. But you you uh, it's so if if anything, trying to work in how we were angry with each other was became more uh, <laughs> became became harder to do because naturally we're both. I feel like you're just. You, She's a very giving actress. I feel like I'm a giving actor, so you just you want to be there for that person, whereas these two characters are just done at the beginning and don't want to deal with it. So if anything, you're, I'm, I'm fighting against your instinct to be like, oh, it's Halle Berry. I've always wanted to work with you. This is going to be so fun. Then it's like, oh, no, I have to tell you I don't like you or trust you right now. So that was, uh, I guess, a little bit of a, a journey. There is a wonderful thing that films can do, no matter if they're a tiny independent movie or a huge spectacle, um, which is it, at least, which is an, engage in conversation, which is make, can make you think. Maybe it can, maybe it can change the way that you look at a certain subject. Maybe it can open your mind, even even if it's not some heart wrenching drama, even if it's a big, fun, splashy spectacle. And I think this movie can do that and does that in a couple different ways. I think it does bring up the fact that, and it's no secret, with the creation of, of AI and the worries of machines rising against you, I mean, Terminator dealt with it. <laughs> and, uh, but there is an increasing f fear that is very real. You know, I think art imitates life, and I think that in, this, in, this, in the science community, I think that is a legitimate fear of if we create something so much that, that takes over, that has such power with our increasingly technological society, what does that mean? Um, so this movie raises that.